Well, good afternoon and welcome to the next session of our teach-in today. Uh, it's been a remarkable learning experience for me, as I'm sure it has been for you. My name is Joe Tai. I'm a professor at the law school here, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, a true luminary in the field of constitutional law, Akhil Reed Amar. Professor Amar will be speaking to us on our Jacksonian Constitution. He is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law both at the law school level and at the undergraduate level. He earned his bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, from Yale College in 1980, and his Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School in 1984, where he was also the editor of the Yale Law Journal. Prior to joining the faculty at the Yale Law School in 1985, he clerked for then Judge Stephen Breyer of the First Circuit Court of Appeals. Professor Amar is both a prolific and a persuasive writer in the field of constitutional law. Among his many books is the leading constitutional law casebook, Processes of Constitutional Decision Making. He is also the author of several other books, including The Constitution and Criminal Procedure, First Principles, The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, and most recently, America's Constitution, A Biography. I have a well-worn copy here, and I would recommend it to you. I share no royalty rights with Professor Marr, and so this is a completely disinterested recommendation, if I may borrow a phrase from lunch. Uh, Professor Amar has one forthcoming book, America's Unwritten Constitution, The Precedents and Principles We Live By. He's been named one of the top 20 legal thinkers in America by Legal Affairs Magazine, and he's the recipient of the American Bar Association Silver, Silver Gavel Award for his America's Constitution, a biography. Please join me in welcoming Professor Amar. Thank you so much. It's, uh, thank you, thank you. It's uh, such an honor to be with you all. I've learned a ton today. Haven't the previous speakers just been extraordinary? So, uh, uh, so uh, presidents are important. Uh, presidents of universities are important, and it's a particular um, honor to be here at, at President Boren's uh, invitation. We had a wonderful time at the President's house, Boyd House, uh, last night. Um, but I want to also remind you of the, uh, and, and I'm sure Larry Summers would want us all to understand that presidents of universities are, are important, but, but so are presidents of the United States. Uh, and um, we've heard a lot about presidents already. I'll come back to that in, in just a minute, but I just can't resist beginning with um, a, a story about um, our eldest son. He just turned 13 this week, so I'm feeling very nostalgic about uh, recalling, you know, he, he turns a man, um, and he, uh, 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 re recalling um, Vic at age six, because I'm gonna say something here it's a challenge to you all. It's a point about civics education and constitutional education uh, for which this university um, is, is uh, so justly renowned. At the age of six, Vic learned his presidents and he asked me a question one day, just out of the blue. He said, I, uh, Dad, when did the British become our friends? And I said, well, that's a really interesting question, Vic. Why do you ask? And he said, Dad, George Washington fought against them, and Dwight Eisenhower fought with them. So sometime in between, they must have become our friends. <laughs> now, what Vic, at the age of six, understood is, it's a very deep point, you know, if kids can learn about baseball players and trade baseball cards and learn statistics and Pokemon, they can learn, you all can learn, the presidents. If you know each of the presidents, you know there are less than 50 of them, and their order, uh, and one page, a Wikipedia-like page about each president, just the, the, the basics. You have, my friends, at your disposal, just with that, the spine of American history, and to some extent, 
the spine of modern world history, just at your disposal. Um, and uh, so learn your presidents if you don't know them. Um, learn one page about them. Our conversation today has really been all about, you know, and, and you need to know them too, because if you can't tell the difference between a green piece of paper with George Washington on it and a green piece of paper with Abe Lincoln or Ulysses S. Grant, you're going to get shortchanged. <laughs> okay. So we've already heard um, a couple of meditations, at least, about George Washington, that wonderful talk by David Hackett Fisher, Gordon Wood, talked about uh, the greatness of Washington and his distinctiveness. Uh, you've heard, we've already heard a little bit about John Adams, of course, later on, David McCullough, um, uh, is going to be part of these proceedings and the preeminent scholar of John Adams. I asked even a question about Adams' son, John Quincy Adams at lunch. We've heard about Thomas Jefferson. We've heard from the Jefferson chair at the University of Virginia, which is Jefferson's university in the, in the person of, of Peter Onuf. Um, we've heard about the so-called father of the Constitution, James Madison, uh, Jefferson's um, good friend. We saw the picture of James Monroe in that boat right there, right beside George Washington. Again, John Quincy Adams was mentioned. That's the spine of American history. Um, and I want to suggest, just because I wanted you to, because this, my talk today, which is going to be about the Constitution, that's what I do, that's where I live and move and, and have my being is intellectually is, is in the Constitution. Um, and I wanted to basically give you one kind of memorable way to, to uh, pull together the basic uh, theme of, of uh, my, my talk. Um, I want to suggest that our Constitution is in its basic structure far more Jacksonian, Andrew Jackson-like, than we've been taught. Um, and I'll tell you at the end of today three ways sort of to remember that it's all about Jackson there um, uh, um, for, for all of you. But um, in a nutshell, our Constitution is more small d democratic, more egalitarian, sort of open to, to uh, men uh, born in uh, lower strata of society, much more open and egalitarian, small d democratic, than the, the standard story that many of us were taught, a story that in the 20th century is associated with um, uh, Charles Beard, um, uh, whose work was, was mentioned actually um, in, in several uh, uh, earlier today. More democratic than we've been taught. And of course, Andrew Jackson is the f basically the leader of the so-called capital D Democratic Party. He's low-born man of the people. Our Constitution is also, and we've already heard a lot about this today, more slaveocratic, pro-slavery than we've been taught, than, than we've acknowledged. And Andrew Jackson is less, he's a slaveholder who is much less apologetic about it, much more openly pro-slavery than the apologetic slaveholders that we've heard about and from uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. So our Constitution in its deep structure, despite maybe the best intentions of the framers, is more slaveocratic than they probably intended, but it's in its deep structure and its DNA and that we've been taught. And our Constitution is much more about national security, about being able to beat the British, for example. Um, Vic, at the age of six, understood. It's about, you know, the beginning, being able to beat the British. And, and James Madison isn't up there on Mount Rushmore because they burned the capital to the ground on his watch, and that's not such a good thing if you want to get yourself on Mount Rushmore. Uh, and so our Constitution, and, not, and, and General Jackson, like General Washington, knows how to beat the British. Uh, and uh, and uh, so... Uh, Manifest Destiny, the Monroe Doctrine, even sort of isolationist America, these are all captured by Andrew Jackson. Uh, they're sort of epitomized by him, exemplified by him, and that's the deep structure of original Constitution. More democratic, more slaveocratic, more about national security um, and hemispheric isolationism. Um, uh, and... Um, that's, it, it unsurprisingly gives us Tocqueville's, the Constitution, Tocqueville's America 
and, ja and the, Jackson's America. He's the dominant figure. And Peter Onuf said this, and I think several others have, and I just want you to hear it pretty clearly. And that constitution failed. We call that, con we call that failure the Civil War. And it failed because of its pro-slavery elements. And it's a challenge for those of us to say, our republic could fail still. And to understand how theirs did um, and what the challenges are today and how even their vision of national security may not make sense for your world. Uh, Gordon t t uh, Wood at lunch talked a little bit about Arab Spring. Your world is very different than theirs um, and on national security. I want to suggest, um, too, uh, that we need to rethink because our Constitution is Jacksonian and our, um, our world is not Jacksonian. Um, Mr. Lincoln fixed the second thing, the pro-slavery element. Um, we still need to rethink the third. That is the challenge of your generation, and that's all summed up with uh, this idea of a Jacksonian Constitution. So now let me defend all of that, and I hope say a few at least interesting things. Um, as um, you heard before, perhaps the uh, I, I think from um, uh, Paul, the the most before Gordon Wood comes along, um, the most influential book um, after the Federalist, uh, Publius. Um, uh, uh, is a book by Charles Beard, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, and that's the dominant regnant paradigm until Gordon Wood's dissertation, which becomes the creation of the American Republic. And Wood, I mean, excuse me, and Beard presents the Constitution as largely sort of a pro-property instrument by the money men. Um, um, it's almost a coup d'etat uh, presided over by a military um, a figure um, meeting in, in a secret conclave, going beyond their um, express instructions and sort of pulling a fast one on the rest of us. That's the kind of, of spirit of, of um, uh, Beard's uh, critique. Um, uh, that, that, that the Constitution was basically designed for um, for the property of of the property by the property for the property, and whether you know it or not, you're a student of Charles Beard because to some extent he influenced the people who wrote the textbooks that you studied in in high school and college, unless you were lucky enough to just get someone who understood Gordon Wood's reinterpretation. And not just Gordon Wood, but a, a, a generation, um, Bernard Balin and, and uh, Douglas Adair, Ed Morgan and others who began to, to reorient us away from that Beardian thesis. I'm here to say actually it's even, Beard was even wronger than um, uh, Wood suggested in his first book, his and later book, The Radicalism of the American Revolution, gets it right. Our Constitution was a radically democratic document for its time. Beard gets it absolutely wrong. He, he must be really gifted because he manages to get you to forget the elephant in the room, which is they put the thing to a vote up and down a continent and they won in state after state after state, and the fix wasn't in. They lost in a couple of places. They lost in New Ham in, in North Carolina. They they lost in in Rhode Island and in, in New York. It is a very near thing, a very close thing, um, 30 to 27. And and. And it's not just that one year. Then they keep voting for the people who gave them the Constitution, George Washington and and. Um, uh, uh, James Madison and others, um, uh, many of the people who are at Philadelphia get elected to the first house and senate, and more, and more. There's remarkable free speech in this series of elections up and down the continent. You can be for the thing, you can be against the thing, and you're not basically cast out. Let me contrast it to 1776. In 1776, here are your choices if you're basically fiercely opposed to American independence, if you're a loyalist. Here are your choices. One, leave. Two, shut the hell up. That's it if you don't want to be tarred and feathered. This is not a joke. 
The king of England has sent, what did we hear from David Hackett Fisher? 60,000 troops, all, all told, a, a massive projection of military force. And they're, when they get here, they're going to slit your throat and your wife's throat and your daughter's throat and your son's throat and your mom's throat. This is not a joke. No one who opposes the American Revolution fiercely goes on to any position of public authority in America, pretty much. Not, they're not heard of. I think Philip Barton Key is the most prominent person I've been able to come up with. Now, flash forward, Constitution. Free speech is extraordinary. You can be fiercely opposed to the Constitution and become President of the United States. You saw a picture of him. That's James Monroe. Vice President of the United States, George Clinton, Elbridge Gary, Justice on the Supreme Court, Sam, Samuel Chase. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. You can be for it, or you can be against it. Remarkable free speech. And Beard makes you forget that. Beard makes you forget all the elections. Beard makes you forget one other thing. He knew it. He's the only one who knew it for a very long time. I once asked Ed Morgan, did you know the following fact? He said, no, that's kind of interesting. In eight of the 13 states, property qualifications were actually eliminated or lowered for this special election on the Constitution. More people were allowed to vote on the Constitution than had ever been allowed to vote on anything else in America. In New York, for example, um, here are the rules. All adult, free male citizens can vote no property on the, on, for the Constitutional Convention. No property qualifications, no religious qualifications, no race qualifications, and Rosie would remind you that, yes, there is a gender qualification. Um, but that's not so much new, that's old. I mean, that, that's just, you know, that's, that's, that, that's always been. So, um, and in, again, eight of the 13 states, either more people got to vote or got to be voted for in this special convention. Uh, these special conventions then were allowed to vote uh, for anything else that in, in the history of America before. In short, we, the people, do ordain and establish this Constitution. An ordainment, the Constitution is a deed, a doing, a constituting. And what is done is nothing less, here's the big, the big first claim, than the most democratic deed in the history of planet Earth up to that point. It is the hinge of modern human history. That one year in which for the first time an entire continent, up and down a whole darn continent, people got to vote on how they and their posterity would, were to be governed and more people were allowed to participate than anything else before and to speak freely. That's what Beard gets you not to see. And the world will never be the same. See, there were a few, if you look back from 1786, let's say, and you look back for the previous millennia of recorded history, very few democracies in the history of the planet. And which ones existed? They existed in tiny little city-states where people met face to face, they had worshipped the same God, they spoke the same language, they had the same climate, you know, warm weather and cold weather, people had never gotten together democratic before. You want to pull together different time zones, different climactic um, zones, you're going to need an emp at different religions and races and nationalities and, 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 and languages. That's an empire, and you're going to need an emperor and a standing army to hold Rome, the Roman world together. Um, uh, and, 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 and by the way, two religions, Catholics and Protestants, that's plenty enough to kill each other over, see, Europe for, for a century. That, and, and America has more than that. It's got Quakers, it's got um, um, uh, 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 Baptists and, and, and Episcopalians and, and, and Catholics, so plenty enough to, to, to slaughter each other over um, if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, so, looking backwards, very few democracies, tiny little city-states, and even if they have democratic constitutions, ways of life, even if they have written documents, never a constitutional, a democratic constitution making process. One man claiming a pipeline you know, uh, to God or something is the lawgiver, handing down the law, Solon, like Kirkus. They're not putting their constitutions to a popular vote in Athens or pre-imperial Rome or Florence or anywhere else in the world. Before 1776, the Brits, they claim that they have some kind of constitution and, and it does have some democratic elements um, uh, uh, created by tradition, a House of Commons, jury trial, but they never have a democratic constitution making process. They still really haven't quite. Um, uh, 
So before 1776, that had never been done. In 1776, in case, you didn't, in case you missed it, the declaration isn't put to a popular vote. There's not time. We're in the middle of a war. The shooting has already started, and that's what David McCullough's you know, magnificent book, 1776, is all about. We're already at war. We don't have time for that kind of thing. But in 1787, 88, we do. This is the year, and it builds on some um, uh, dress rehearsals, so for so they seem in retrospect, some early efforts to do this sort of thing at the state level. Massachusetts actually adopts the Constitution democratically in 1780, and David McCullough would want you to know that that's John, John Adams was a drafts person there, and then New Hampshire follows um, in 1784. Um, but now, this we do process is being done on a continental scale, and my claim is the world will never, is never the same. Um, it almost failed, the Civil War, Lincoln comes along, and you, you heard about that, and now, just so we're clear, half the world is democratic. See, it was, there were very few democracies for the previous millennia of recorded history. Then we, the people, do this thing up and down the continent, and we manage to actually survive um, an effort by one group to set aside, by force of arms, a, 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 a proper election. We call it that secession, that's the Civil War. You can't have government of, by, and for the people if the people lose a fair election, fair and square, actually try to undo it by force of arms and try to shut down free speech, which they tried to do. It is a crime to be anti-slavery in the Deep South in the 1850s. It's a crime, a capital offense to criticize slavery in the 1850s. Abraham Lincoln's name doesn't get put on the ballot south of Virginia, and he gets zero popular votes. Not electoral, but popular votes south of Virginia. So democracy was under assault because there's also the slavocratic principle that I'm going to tell you about, but we, we, the, the Civil War proved that we could actually make democracy work, and it does end slavery, and the world will never be the same. Look at many more democracies at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, and then you look at the end of the 20th century, we won that century. We won it big time. I like our prospects for the future. The world is becoming American in this very deep way. My, my very big claim, you know, embedded in, it's a Jacksonian a constitution. It is way more democratic than we were taught by Charles Beard and his disciples. It's nothing less than the hinge of human history. It's the Big Bang. We are still feeling the reverberations of that. Um, just give you an example of the reverberations. You bring all these people together um, in these state ratifying conventions, because it was secret Philadelphia, what's the first thing to do when you p p bring people together? They can talk amongst themselves and they actually say, listen, one, version 1.0 1 is really flawed. Where, where are the rights? Where are the Bill, Bill of Rights? That, the, bill, the thing that we call the Bill of Rights that comes out of this year of, of actually asking people what they think. The phrase that appears in more of the first ten amendments than any other is the words of the people. It's in the first amendment, the second, the fourth, the ninth, the tenth. Um, and the first amendment, which talks about freedom of speech, where's that coming from? From the actual practice of free speech that's actually existing in this year that actually where people get to talk freely, which they couldn't, frankly, do in 1776 because we were in the middle of a war way more democratic than you were taught, the hinge of human history. And in order, by the way, to get we the people to say yes for this thing, this isn't just one person, one vote, one time, something like that. They have to actually put, the framers do, all sorts of democratic sweeteners in the Constitution to get people to vote for the thing. Otherwise, they're not going to vote for it. So what are the property qualifications to be a member of the House of Representatives, according to the Constitution? Correct. None. What are the property qualifications to be a senator, according to the Constitution? Constitutional property? None. You can be a U.S. senator and not even be eligible to vote in your, in your home, home state. We, this is a point that Gordon, uh, what, what are the uh, property qualifications to be present? Every state has basically, um, for virtually every state, uh, property qualifications to vote for or be governor, but not the Constitution. No religious qualifications to be a federal officer. Indeed, a ban on religious tests in Article 6. No state in its Constitution has a ban on religious tests. And we do, we make it put it open to everyone. Um, uh, since uh, Jane Austen was invoked um, uh, uh, at lunch, and I'm a huge Jane Austen fan, 
um, in order to be a member of the so-called House of Commons in England at the time, you have to own or rent real property uh, generating to be, have a country um, uh, um, uh, um, seat in England. You have to own or rent real property generating an annual income of 600 pounds sterling. Not worth 600 pounds sterling, but generating an annual income of 600 pounds sterling, which is roughly the equivalent of like Bingley's estate or Darcy's Pemberley or something like that. Um, uh, and and there no, you can just be a school teacher a minister held in high regard, and you can be a senator of the United States, congressperson, president of the United States. We have low-born people who are presidents of the United States. And we have one now. We had one in Abe Lincoln. We had one in Andy Jackson, low-born, okay? Only, maybe not only in America, but it's very distinctive. Um, two of the four guys up on Mount Rushmore, not member of any formal church at the time of their ascension of the presidency, Jefferson, and Lincoln, pretty striking stuff when you see what the rest of the world, even today, is up to. So way, oh, and I, Gordon Wood would want me to remind you of one other thing, because you might be a little annoyed that the, the, these people in Congress take your money and don't, um, uh, and pay themselves and don't help the rest of us so much. Don't resent congressional salaries. It's a remarkable democratic feature of the Constitution that we pay our lawmakers, because if we don't, the only people who can serve are aristocrats. It's a remarkable democratic feature of the Constitution um, to make public service open to low-born um, uh, folks who aren't independently wealthy. England doesn't do that until 1911. They were that far ahead of, of the world. Now, where are all these democratic ideas coming from? I don't think these guys at Philadelphia are geniuses. They're lawyers, and I know a lot of lawyers, very few of them are geniuses. Lawyers at their best actually copy what has worked before. On issue after issue after issue, they actually borrow from best state practices. How should we launch the Constitution? Well, Massachusetts and, and uh, North Carolina put it to a popular vote. That's a good idea. Um, should we have a census? Very democratic idea. Yes, we should. New York and Pennsylvania have done it. Let's follow that. Should we have direct election? Yeah, all the states have direct election in the House of Representatives. Remember, the Articles of Confederation didn't. So that's a big democratic um, reform. Should we pay people? Yes, Pennsylvania does, and that's actually a good system. How should we structure our executive? Well, Massachusetts has the best model, and so let's sort of copy that one and, and add to it. Um, um, so they are basically copying the best features of the state constitutions. Um, and you see that, that, that if you read uh, um, Gordon's first book, uh, Creation of the American Republic, it's how the federal constitution is a reaction to the first and second round of state constitution making beginning in 1776. More democratic than you thought. That's the good news. We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Alas, more slavocratic. They get one little thing wrong. It just turns out to be not so little a thing. Three-fifths. What three-fifths means is that, well, what does it mean? What should it have been? That, you know, slaves are counted as three-fifths for apportionment purposes. That's wrong, right? Everyone should count for, for one, right? Should be five-fifths, right? No. It should be zero-fifths. No state should ever get extra credit for having extra slaves. The question isn't whether slaves are voting. Of course slaves aren't voting. Just like married women aren't voting. And married women, by the way, Ro Rosemary, Rosemary gave you a story about um, unmarried women, about widows and femme soul. Um, but married women can't vote very easily because you have to vote. There's not secret ballot in a lot of places. You have to vote viva voce. And if your husband, under the laws of curvature, can beat you up afterwards, you're not voting your own interest there. Um, um, you, you know, so, so even in New Jersey, it was actually unmarried women, which is a, a small group. Slaves never voted, and they can't. They can't vote their own free will. The question isn't how much clout slaves are going to have. It's how much clout slave states are going to have. And three-fifths means for every extra slave you have, you get more voting clout in the House of Representatives, and that's a vicious feature of the Constitution. And not just in the House of Representatives. Where else do you get extra credit? The Electoral College. Yes, you were taught that the Electoral College is because they didn't believe in democracy and they thought republics were different than democracy. Baloney. I've just given you a whole bunch of re uh, arguments that they were far more democratic than we've been taught. And they believed in direct election of governors and direct election of the members of the House of Representatives. The Electoral College isn't quite because they didn't believe in democracy. Nor is it because it's some balance between big and small state, which is what you've been taught. The big state guy always wins. 
We've only had three small state presidents in all of American history, Bill Clinton, Zachary Taylor, and um, Franklin Pierce. That's it. Virginia's the biggest state, and for 32 of the first 36 years, it's a Virginian. And Massachusetts is the second biggest state, or the third, depending on how you count. And then it's the Adamses, you know, uh, for uh, eight more years. It's the big state people. The big state people dominate the capital. It's not big state, small state. If, that's House versus Senate. But if, if it was big state, small state, boy, those guys are dumb, and they weren't dumb. Um, it's, James Carville would say, slavery, stupid. That's what the Electoral College is most fundamentally about. Um, uh, it's true, it's also difficult before you have political parties to know, um, you know, if you're from Massachusetts, who's good from Virginia and vice versa. But, but once we have political parties emerge, you know, you can, you, and you can vote even retrospectively. You can decide whether you like the incumbent, whether he's done anything good for the last four years, and, and you, you know enough to vote on that retrospectively. So we have the Electoral College because of three-fifths. Um, this is almost the death of us. And why did they get this one number wrong? Because they didn't have any track record among the states. None of the slave states had census formula. So we, they didn't know. They, they just plucked a number out of a hat. They plucked a number for, that was used for tax purposes and jammed it into a formula for representation in the House and the Electoral College where it didn't fit. It turned out to be a huge benefit for the southern states. You heard about Thomas Jefferson. You heard a little bit about Adams. Who won the election of 1800, 1801? You all say, well, Tom Jefferson did, of course. You take away the extra votes created by three-fifths, and John Adams wins that election. Okay? There are two elections of a southerner against a northerner, Jefferson against Adams, and Adams wins the first, and then um, um, uh, Ohio flips, you know, Florida flips, Pennsylvania's not, is the, the swing state at the time is New York, which is a slave state at the time with Aaron Burr, but it flips. Um, but without the pro-slavery bias of the extra three-fifths, John Adams wins even in 1800, and he, he knows that, and all the Federalists know that. Um, and the Constitution is amended and to fix other flaws in the Electoral College, but not that one. The 12th Amendment makes the Constitution very safe for political parties um, and for plebiscitary um, a populist presidency and very safe for a pro-slavery party. That pro-slavery party is the party of Jefferson and Madison. And yes, in principle, they're opposed to slavery, but once they understand that their bread is buttered on the southern side, the party that they are founding has its base in slavery, you don't hear so much about anti-slavery from those guys. And even great northerners like John Quincy Adams, when he's president, he doesn't say that much against slavery. Afterwards, he does. There is no openly anti-slavery president before 1860. If, here's a simple test of anti-slavery. Simply someone who gets up as president says the following two things. Slavery is wrong. We should eventually get rid of it. Indeed, Don Fehrenbacher shows there's no anti-slavery cabinet officer before 1860, in all of American history. Just, just saying, slavery's wrong, and we should eventually get rid of it. There are many pro-slavery cabinet officers and pro-slavery present. C, E, G, Andrew Jackson. C, John C. Calhoun from my um, uh, uh, college. There's a residential college named uh, uh, um, after him. It is pro-slavery, the party that Jefferson and Madison will found, which can call itself the Democratic Party, is Jackson's party, and it becomes more and more emphatically pro-slavery, and ruthlessly so, and aggressively so. It's a cancer that grows and grows and grows and almost kills us. And that's called the Civil War. You know, we got, we killed it, we, we bested it in the nick of time. And we were lucky, not smart, on that. And sometimes it's, you know, it's better to be lucky than smart. And I think Bismarck said that providence in its infinite wisdom has a spe God has a special place in his heart um, uh, for uh, fools, drunkards in the United States of America. Um, so, um, more democratic than you were taught, more pro-slavery than you were taught, and finally, much more about national security than you were taught. That's Andrew Jackson, too. Why would 13, and you know the history of the world, up to 1787, why would you ever think that a continental democracy could work. You know, different time zones and all the religious diversity and, and Montesquieu doubts whether it can be done. There's no model in world history of its success. Why would you think that this would work? And we are taught, because ah, Madison says, and the Federalist number what? Which is the Federalist number where he says, actually, diversity will be good and, and a democracy will work better if there's some modest diversity. What's the key Federalist paper that everyone paid any attention to at the founding? That Madison persuaded everyone. 
Federalist 10, that's what we're all taught. And Doug Adair proves that no one reads Federalist 10 at the founding. No one at all. It's not, and nor for the next hundred years. You read Federalist 10 because there was a certain scholar who thought Federalist 10 was front and center, really important. That scholar was named Charles Beard. Okay? Um, and he thought it's all about the class issue and, 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 and religious diversity and other things. Madison's Federalist 10 is brilliant. I respectfully disagree with Peter Onuf. I'd give Madison, oh, he said Jefferson. I'd give Madison tenure on the basis of Federalist 10. Um, um, and it's a brilliant argument, and precisely because of it, no one pays any attention. P people don't understand brilliant arguments in their time, only much later in the academic. So that's not, well, if you had a good argument for why 13 separate colonies should actually create one continental regime, the likes of which had never been seen before in human history, would you wait till your 10th op-ed to make that point? Every person saying, you know, why? Listen, this is what it is, just so you see what we see clearly. It's the equivalent of today proposing world government. A real world government with a world president and a world army and a world legislature. That's what's being proposed. It's that audacious. And ordinary people say, what the heck are you talking about? Virginia has been on its own from the 1620s. Its House of Burgesses, renamed House of Delegates, has been up and running. It's been a separate entity. Yes, it's connected to these other colonies loosely before 1776 in the same way that in 1930, you have a British Commonwealth of Nations, including Canada, India, New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, okay, a common crown, but, but no real continental structure of any sort. Now you're proposing to take these warm weather and cold weather people and create one sort of strong, indivisible nation state? Why the heck would you ever do that? Why the heck would you ever go for world government today? Let your imagination roam as free as, as possible. There's, there's only one reason today that would get you to vote for world government. If the Martians were coming, that's it. And then you'd say, well, don't really love those Chinese guys, but they are homo sapiens, and so, yeah, okay. If the, if the Martians are coming, and that's what Publius' argument is. We almost lost the last war. We were lucky to win it. You know, uh, David Fisher told you about some of the, 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 how fortune smiled. If you read... David McCullough's 1776, you really do see that it seems the hand of providence even in the weather, you know, on, on, on all sorts of crucial days. We were lucky to win that last one. We might lose the next one. So here's the argument of Publius. My fellow Americans, it's, it's in Federalist 2. It's continued in Federalist 4 to 6. It's summarized in Federalist 8, if you read, uh, 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 Federalist 9, excuse me, if you read um, nothing else. Um, um, uh, read 8 and 9. Look around the world today, says Publius. Who's free in all the world? Apart from us Americans. You know, not the Russians, not the Chinese, not the Indians, not the Africans, not the Turks, not the Poles. British and maybe the Swiss, and that's about it. And the Netherlands are in the process of losing this. Now, why? By the way, what do the Swiss have in common? You know, not language, they've got four of them, not religion, they've got two, which is enough to kill each other. These places have defensible borders. What the Swiss have that holds them together is the Alps. It's pretty hard to charge up a hill. And Britain is an island, and it's naturally defensible. And before it was an, uh, uh, unified, uh, Gordon mentioned Scotland, when you had the Scots battling against the British, because Hadrian's Wall is no Alps, it's no Great Wall of China, it's not a, a defensible border. And before, actually, um, the union of Scotland and England, the Scots were whomping on the English and the English, you know, were whomping back and, and Mel Gibson was coming down and the Queen of France was um, intervening and playing and no one is safe in that world. The union of Scotland and England means you don't need soldiers on the island. You just need a, a small navy that needs to be able to beat the Spanish Armada and that's it and navies are less defend, uh, threatening to domestic liberty. My fellow Americans, says Publius, we need to emulate the model of England and Scotland form an indivisible union, and here's what we're going to do. We'll have this 3,000 mile wide moat, it's the English Channel times 50, and it'll keep the, uh, the old powers, the monarchical powers at bay. We'll kick the Brits out. We'll need a very small army to do this, very small, so small that it won't threaten domestic liberty. We'll kick the Brits out, we'll kick the Spanish out, we'll kick the French out, we'll kill the Indians, 
will control the continent, manifest destiny, the no doctrine will be hegemont in our hemisphere, and no one will screw with us. That is Andrew Jackson. That is the original constitutional vision. And by the way, although Publius doesn't see that, you look at a map of the world in 1943, you know, and who's free? It's basically the Brits and the Von Trapps in Switzerland. It's the same thing because it's hard to charge up a hill and Hitler it hesitates to launch an amphibious invasion because that's not so easy to do. Okay, it's about what our friends in Israel would call defensible borders. More democratic, more slaveocratic, more about national security, more about, in fact, that's, that's going to be Andrew Jackson's world. He can beat the Brits, Battle of New Orleans. You know, he doesn't like black people so much. He's emphatically pro-slavery, doesn't much love the Native Americans. That's the structure of the Constitution, and it's not our world. I'm not, you know, uh, I, I don't know which side, you know, I'd be on. I'm, uh, I think, you know, probably the servile side in, in that world. Now, here's the, the, the challenge then. Why, why, have, why have I told you this story? So um, two ways of remembering this story and one challenge. If you sort of forget, you, know, you go to any ATM and you're going to get Andrew Jackson's, okay? So that's, you know, just, uh, um, so just sort of remember our Constitution originally is Jacksonian. You're from the great state of Oklahoma, and that's, of course, if you understand your state history, it's all about the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears and Andrew Jackson. We are living through its legacy today. But here's the most important point. The story I've just told is really um, inspirational in some ways. We give the world more democracy than it ever had before, and we're feeling the reverberations even today. The, you know, in your lifetime, the wall comes down. You know, India, this amazing multicultural democracy on the American model, inspired by people like Thoreau and, and Jefferson. Arab Spring, the world is becoming American. We showed th that it actually could work. That's the inspiring part of my story. The challenge, though, is you need to understand, one, their constitution failed because they didn't really, they wished slavery away rather than coming up with a credible solution to it. They could have. They could have said three-fifths now, but two-fifths in 20 years, and one-fifth, you know. Um, uh, now, what are the issues today that we are wishing away, you know, that might be the death of us, foreign oil, um, climate change, okay? They failed because they've ultimately, um, uh, hope is not a plan. Um, and, and we need to sort of, for all their greatness, we need to recognize that failure and then ask ourselves, where might we be failing? That's so one ch challenge I wanted to, to leave with you all. And here's the second. The framers' vision was of an isolationist America, fortress America. What made America safe is not the Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights wasn't even part of the original plan. And when it finally is adopted, it's not enforced for most of, of its, its history. What makes, it's not about courts, it's not about Bill of Rights, even though I know that's what you were taught. What made America free for most of our history is we had no major standing army in peacetime of any significance. So, um, until World War II. And so we don't have these th military thugs using other military thugs to sit on us, the way Saddam Hussein sat on his people, or um, Gaddafi, or you know, thugs from around the world. That's what made America free. And 50 years ago this year, General Eisenhower, my son understands, is like George Washington. We've had three George Washingtons. We just called the second Ulysses Grant and the third Dwight Eisenhower. Three sort of you know, national generals, presidents above party. And Vic understood that as six years old. So remember your presidents. You'll see interesting patterns here. So Dwight Eisenhower 50 years ago recognizes that the world that he's handing to his successor is very different than the world he grew up in. A military industrial complex. We have to think about these things. Because you are facing a different world than the founder's world. Challenges of a military industrial complex, but finally, here's the, the rest of the world isn't monarchical anymore. And, you know, and much of it is not um, oppressive anymore. We defeated in the 20th century fascism and communism and some of these other um, uh, Nazism isms. And so now th the rest of the world is becoming more American. We are becoming more like the rest of the world. We're much more multicultural than ever before. We have immigration, not just from Northern Europe, but from 
all of Europe and from South America and Asia and Africa, we're becoming more like the world. The world is becoming more like us. This is the challenge of your generation. I, I'm speaking especially to the students um, here in the audience to try to rethink in a big way the doctrines you've inherited in the same way, and here I close, that Publius, these young people, uh, they're in their 30s, Madison and, and Hamilton, rethought that, that received the inherited doctrines of their world. They were taught you can't have a continental democracy. And they said, oh yeah? Um, they, we, you know, my claim is that just as they had to sort of really think hard about the changes that were happening in their world that created unique opportunities, my friends, the same is true for us today. History is still happening. There's lots of it to write, and, and we can be founders for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Marr, for that engaging, entertaining, and thought-provoking insight into the framing generation and into our Jacksonian constitution. We have um, time for a handful of questions. There's an open microphone right here, so I would encourage you to come up. Um, let me exercise the moderator's prerogative and, and ask the first question. Um, and, and for this, I'd like to turn the uh, historical lens around and ask you to imagine, if you will, what the framing generation as well as what the Jacksonian generation uh, might think if they looked through that historical lens at us and at the Constitution that we have today, uh, including all the post-Civil War amendments, banning slavery, um, guaranteeing equal protection under the law, much later giving women the right to vote, as well as modern bedrock Supreme Court decisions, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the line of cases post-1937 that gave an expansive authority for Congress to regulate the economy and uh, many aspects of our daily lives, um, the one person, one vote principle, uh, as well as perhaps more modern and controversial decisions like Citizens United. Um, what would the framing and the Jacksonian generation think of the Constitution that we have today, and should their reactions matter to us? Wonderful question. Um, you're hearing from people from different disciplines. Trained historians often hesitate to, to answer presentist questions. What would you know, an historical figure think? about today. They often emphasize the pastness of the past. Lawyers use history. We have to because we have to decide the case either for the plaintiff or the defendant. And so we have to figure out the end. Does the history support more the plaintiff's vision of the present or uh, uh, the, the defendant's vision? Um, uh, historians have the great luxury of not having you know, you put ten historians, um, you lay them end to end, and they'll never reach a conclusion. Um, but, but lawyers actually have to, and judges decide. So I'll answer that question, even though the, you know, the pure historians may sort of cringe. Um, uh, our Constitution is an intergenerational project. The founders' vision failed. It gets reborn in the Civil War, and the story doesn't end. My claim is that um, the founding is like a big bang. Um, and it creates a tremendous democratic energy that sort of gives momentum for all that happens subsequently. So, if you so it immediately leads to Bill of Rights, which, as I mentioned, has five mentions of the words, the people, and the First Amendment. And then eventually, look at the trajectory of amendments. Isn't it interesting? Almost all of them have expanded liberty and equality and no restrictions, basically, with the possible exception of prohibition, which, of course, fails. So no anti-flag burning amendments or anti-gay rights amendments or anti-Catholic amendments or all sort of pro-liberty, pro-equality. It's pretty striking. It, the Constitution gives us a momentum. It gives us a narrative. Gordon Wood said, he asked, and I've heard him talk about this before, he says, why do we study history? And he, I think he said, partly to understand who we are. A people without a history is like a, a human being without memory, you know, like am amnesia. So who we are, where did we come from? And presumably then, 
where might we be going? It, it sort of gives us a sense of, and I'm, what I'm saying is, I'm so proud to be an American, that, so lucky that this country let my family uh, in um, a few years before I was born, because in the history of the world, we are part of an epic project. Um, there are very few societies, I think, that, you know, that where I could get up and say, this year in the history of this nation is the hinge of modern history and not be laughed at. Um, so it's an extraordinary project. I'll give you one other example just of how you, you, you have to... Um, so I think they would say we've actually been completing their project. Um, they... Um, uh, um, seven of the 39 of them were um, foreign-born. Um, and you actually could be foreign born and be a president at the time. Alexander Hamilton was fully eligible, otherwise I'm not sure he would have wanted to, you know, he would have liked the thing. Um, so they were far more open to immigrants than anyone before, and if we made it even still more open, I think we'd be caring forward their project in the same way that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, legal immigration I'm talking about, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and the 19th Amendment, Rose Marie Zagari explained to you how the 19th is building on a certain tradition um, of more inclusion than what happened the day before. That's my claim about this year. It's, it's, it's more democratic energy, more free speech than we've ever seen before. Um, so I think although they'd be shocked at um, the leveling tendencies and, uh, um, and the fact that leaders actually don't lead so much anymore but just follow. There are things that I think, and Gordon Wood ca captures a little bit this, their elegiacal sense that, that something has been lost, some of the aristocratic virtues. But for all of that, I think they would recognize in us their posterity, the continuation of their radical revolutionary project. Um, because the Confederation of the States was in jeopardy, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention wisely chose to stress unification of the states rather than the controversial subject of the abolition of slavery. As such, the Constitution is, was not necessarily pro-slavery. Do you have any other proof that the Constitution promoted slavery? And also, what is so terribly wrong with minding our own business and not interfering in the arguments of other nations, as the Monroe Doctrine clearly states that America is to do? Thank you so much for that very good question. So, look, the question is um, at what point the Civil War becomes inevitable. Historians often ask questions about inevitability. Was this a Greek tragedy which no, no matter what Oedipus does, you see, he's doomed, he's destined to kill his father and, and marry his mother, and, and he, he tries to escape his destiny and it doesn't happen and, you know, the Godfather is a tragedy because Michael doesn't want to be like his father. You know, that's, you know, my father's world, okay, not mine, but he gets sucked back in. That's why it's a Greek tragedy. You see, so the question is, you see, what would it have been, I'm, my claim is for geostrategic reasons, you got to get South Carolina on board. Otherwise, you have an undefended southern flank. How do you deal with that? You, you know, you have to actually unify the, the, the continent geostrategically because that's actually important. But if in order to do that, you have to make such compromises with slavery that it's eventually going to doom the project, then it's just foreordained failure. And my claim is that that actually wasn't the case, that it was a failure of statecraft. There was a solution that was imaginable, and they missed it. And it's the same solution, in my view, for our dependence on foreign oil and other... You see, slavery was almost the death of... We are giving billions of dollars to basically the most reactionary regimes in the world, these, these petro-dictators. This is bad for the world. I happen to believe it's also probably not great for um, uh, uh, our um, um, uh, Mother Earth either. Um, and we are addicted to it in the same way that they were addicted to slavery. That was part of their thing. So how do you solve this? Here's how you solve it. In time using time. You have to compromise with evil now, but you have to, this is Lincoln's, Lincoln says two things. He says, slavery is wrong. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember time I did not think so. And then he turns around and says, and I don't, I'm not an abolitionist, immediate abolitionist. Well, how can you believe in both? He says, because we're stuck with slavery. We're addicted to, what's his solution? Thesis, 
and synthesis. What's a synthesis? I will put slavery on a path of ultimate extinction. You know, it, eventually we have to get there. Okay, so um, and so uh, here's what they did for importation. They said you can import before 1808, but after 1808, Congress can prohibit interslave. I would have it would have been better if they said must rather than can, but they could have said, you know, um, slavery where it exists is okay, but you can't spread it to the West. You could have said three-fifths in the existing states, but not in any of the new states. You could have said three-fifths now, but two-fifths in 20 years and one-fifth, but eventually you can't get extra credit for extra slaves. That's just wrong in principle. You have to use time because if we as moral human beings, he's, Stephen Douglas, he says, why are we talking about morality? You know, let's just, you know, uh, and, be, and Lincoln says, because we are human beings and we are moral creatures, we can't not talk about morality. Slavery is wrong, let's admit that. Now, once we all admit that, there are lots of things we can do. We, we may have to make certain compromises in the here and now, but let's all agree that one day our great-grandchildren should be clean, freed from this blight, okay? So I'm saying that's what they could have done, and South Carolina wouldn't have liked it. And the South Carolinas are... Carolinians, with all due respect, are nut jobs from day one. And in <laughs> July 1776, the same month as the Declaration, a, a South Carolinian named Thomas Lynch, great last name, um, Thomas Lynch says to the other members of the, uh, um, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the Continental Congress, you start talking about slavery, we're out of here. He's threatening to walk, you know, while the British are we're here to kill. He would never persuade the South Carolinians, but here's what you could have done. You could have isolated them. You have to get the Virginians on board, and some of the Virginians, many of them, are reasonable. They're slaveholders who know that slavery is a bad thing. They don't want to actually pass it on to their children and grandchildren because they think it actually corrupts the soul even of masters. Um, George Mason says that. You, you know, Tom, Thomas Jefferson says it but doesn't do stuff about it because his party depends on it. James Madison understands this in his bones. So does George Washington who free, provides for the freeing of his slaves at the end of his life. The reasonable Virginians understand. They're slaveholders who understand that slavery is a bad business. You have to persuade them. Then the North Carolinians have to decide whether they're going to cast their lot with the nut jobs down south or they're going to go with Virginia and they're going to go with Virginia and you isolate the nut jobs. And that's how politics has to work today. There are some nut jobs, and they have to be isolated. You have to create a coalition of the center. At the time, the center are the reasonable slaveholders. George Washington, you know, preeminent among them. And you could have done it. And it was a failure of statecraft to not come up with it. They solved so many things. It seems mean of me to just emphasize the one thing that they failed. But, but the system basically did break because of it. You know, and, and, and we need to understand that because our system could be in, at risk today. That's why, see, I, I'm a presentist, so I want you to understand that they almost failed because we could unless we, the people today, see this. And we solve our problems in time. We need a 20-year plan. To get, we took 20 years, 30 years to get into this hole. It will take us a while to get out, but we all have to agree we're in a hole, and here's a long-term solution. Akil, thank you so much.